You are listening to listening www.integralnaked.org. Hello, Alanis. Hi, Ken. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So, what have you been up to? Um, I just got back from Big Sur. Yeah. One of my favorite places on the planet. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. Have you spent time a lot of time there? Or? Not a lot of time, but I've been there. Um, of course, Esalen Institute is right. located there, and Mike Murphy's a really good friend of mine. Mm. And Esalen is kind of, you know, sort of one of the spearheads of letting Eastern traditions into this country, and also the human potential movement basically mm. was birthed there. Yeah. So, what part of Big Sur, were you in? Were you at Esalen? Or you... I went to do just room and board at Esalen, which I do often, but I guess they'd had a workshop there this weekend, and, and they were pretty full up, so I stayed at Post Ranch. I often just go because Big Sur itself is such a, a calling to me. In what way? Just the whole feel of it? Because I mean, it's an extraordinary kind of vibration to the place. Mm, the vibration, the, the aesthetic of it. In Northern California, really, there's a consciousness in that area of the planet that this has a really great vibration that I connect with. And then right. the history of it, too. Henry Miller and I.S. Nin and Jack Kerouac spent time there, so there's the whole writer vibration that's there, too. And then I'm a hippie at heart. Yeah. <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike Murphy is really an extraordinary guy and one of my best friends, both mm-hmm. personally and theoretically. And he's really sort of pioneered the integral approach to mm-hmm. spiritual development. Oh, great. And in part, he got it from Aurobindo, when he spent a lot of time in India and at the Aurobindo ashram mm-hmm. and has written enormously about what integral transformative practice means. Mm-hmm. And the general essence of that, basically, Mike Murphy and George Leonard and, and myself, I guess, are the ones that have done a lot of work in this area Mm. and the general idea about integral transformative practice is that it's sort of like spiritual cross training Mm. that if you exercise aspects of the body and aspects of the mind Mm. and aspects of spirit and you do it concurrently Mm. you get faster gains in each of them Mm. yeah big yes to that yeah right and yes So that's something that Mike and I have spent a lot of time going over and what are the sort of the minimum modules you need and what is the fastest type of gain you can get and exactly what practices should be done and so on. Hmm. That's what's really astonishing about what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years is when that influx all first started in the 60s basically, We had no idea how it fit together or what it meant or which pieces were really important or which were sort of just sort of important. Mm -hmm. A lot of things came and went in terms of new practices and, you know, revolutionary new paradigms that were going to change everything. Mm -hmm. But basically over two or three decades, it's really sort of shaken down into some enduring and really important human potential practices. And of course, there's still hundreds of various types of practices, but fundamentally meditation and fundamentally body work and fundamentally work on shadow issues. Mm. And that was a big thing that meditation doesn't cover shadow work like a show. Having met a lot of people who are meditators and more kind of on the spiritual side of things, there there at times can be the, the lack of integrating the shadows, and then I'll, equally I'll be in a lot of, sort of psychologically-minded circles, and I'm often craving th- that sense of spirit for it to be imbued in the whole, you know, more like the transpersonal psychology, just having yeah. having both be available is my favorite. And you would think that that would be more popular, wouldn't you? You'd yeah. think it would be more common that you would find those two things. Yeah, you would think. Probably becoming more common now. But still, still to this day, I find myself in certain herds or tribes or circles where there's one kind of focal point, and I, I usually glaze over after a while. <laughs> yeah. there's, not a, there's not a multi-tentacled approach to something. I, 
I usually need to leave. Yeah. Yeah, well... <laughs> I usually have to go home. <laughs> yeah. That's such a intrinsically integral approach that you have. I'm curious how long you have had that orientation. Do you think that you were kind of born that way, or do you think you came about it in the course of your own artistic growth and development, this desire to have a comprehensive approach? I think it was a combination of, I felt like I was a, a little witch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was uh, unusual, which is unusual in terms of in the environments I was in. It was not something that was welcomed or championed by any means. Yeah. Um, tolerated at, at best, probably, which yeah. was better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then I think my my orientation toward wanting to understand the hu- human condition was both born of my love of God and life, but also just born of my ultimately being resistant to my own pain. Yeah. So, so in, a, in a good way, I was actually motivated by this perfectionism and this naive concept that at some point, if I do enough inner work and I integrate enough shadows <laughs> and I understand psychology enough and I can have dialogues and resolve conflict, then one day I will be totally yeah. peaceful, right. inhuman. <laughs> right. But I can still be here to enjoy the trees and the birds and the love and the sensual pleasures, but I will have arrived on some level. So that naive thought actually was a propulsion toward all the things that I now approach just for the sheer love and joy of it, more as a process and a journey. Yeah. Sort of looking over your artistic career, I can see how that would have a major role to play in your own growth in terms of becoming more and more comprehensive and more and more integral. I think one of the things that stands out in your work and I think brilliantly, is the way that you have, in a sense, done soul-searching, done really deep emotional searching in yourself, and more importantly, really been courageous enough to share it with the audience. Hmm. And, And I really think that's an important point, to be able to sort of courageously share your own emotional orientation, your own particular insides, if you will, Hmm. Um, because that's not something that actually is that common among artists, as strange as that might seem to say at, at first. Artists are sometimes known for displaying their interiors, but I really don't think many of them do. I think it's more sort of a exterior of the interior. Hmm. But I or, think, or maybe hidden behind a character or a... Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah uh-huh. But I, I think that your work has really pretty consistently, I think, been noteworthy for going really, really deep, and then being willing to share the results of that, good, mm-hmm. bad, or ugly. <laughs> and I, that's really incredible, actually. Thank you. I, I uh, take that in. I think there's a little less courage um, <laughs> apply <laughs> than I may be given credit for, but I, my goal, actually, my aspiration is to apply the, the courage that it takes to share my personal findings publicly applying that same courage to my day-to-day interactions. It's a lot easier for me to share with thousands of people what's going on in my life because there is, although it may not sound like it, there is an impersonal aspect to it. Yeah. So taking that and bringing that quality into my interactions with people whom I love is actually ten times scarier for me. (laughs) Yeah. So um, it's almost like a star of Bethlehem. A lot of times I'll write a song and ten years later... I'll hear it as though it's being spoken to me because it's what I need to hear. So, Which is interesting. I mean, it's sort of like your higher self was creating a little bit ahead of the time that the rest mm-hmm. of you was able of hearing it. Exactly. But audiences have responded to it, I think, and that's what has been so really wonderful about your own career. Mm, yeah, and- I feel like I invite, I give people the invitation and certainly the permission and as best as I can anyway, the safety to experience the full breadth of humanity. Right. <laughs> it's very colorful, as you know, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as you of all people know. Yes, and the creative process itself can plug into sort of different depths or heights of the human being, the human soul, the human psyche. Mm. And certain aspects of it just sort of goes kind of a little bit superficially. And there's a lot of that kind of creativity out there. Mm-hmm. But then other aspects of it seem to really plug into a very, very higher self. And that's the thing we were talking about a little bit last time we talked in terms of 
the creative process itself feeling like almost that you're sort of being inhabited, that there's this extraordinary insight or awareness or force or beauty or grace or intelligence that is forming itself. Mm. And sort of your job is to both get out of the way Mm. and craft it, basically make sure it gets delivered. But it's an extraordinary process. It's a humbling one. It's, uh, yeah, using my psyche and my brain as as that which siphons this information that's coming through. And it's also my unique take on it. You know, it's like that's what I think is so great about all the different artists out there, whether they're superficial or profound or whatever label I put on them. I, it's just such a unique version, you know, and speaks to whatever capacity any given artist has for emotionality or otherwise. Right. And yeah, it's a very humbling experience to the point where the process itself is very quick, but I think we spoke about this briefly too. It's like being hooked up to an an IV, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. training everything out in, in however many minutes. In some cases, a song will be written in about 20 minutes. Yeah. And then being done, but the, you know, the lead up to it is a life lived. You know? And that, in terms of being an artist, sort of the same question. Did you, do you think you were kind of born to do that? Was there a time? Do you remember your earliest memories that you wanted to be an artist, or did that come about? Fairly slowly. I mean, you, your first album was when you were like 17, I think. Yeah, I, I actually wrote my first songs when I was 10, and I had a, a record label that I put together with a friend of mine when I was 11 because no record companies wanted to sign me, which I think is understandable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little scared. Although nowadays, God, they'd sign you when you were a, an embryo. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll table that conversation for another time. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they, I've been uh, I started writing songs when I was nine and, and had a record out when I was eleven, and that's when the formal songwriting started. But I I remember having written poetry, some pretty funny ones, <laughs> as far back as six years old. And I basically it was like a, a, a Judy Garland Shirley MacLaine thing for me. Like I loved dancing and dancing and writing and singing and acting and that whole right. that whole part <laughs> drama. Right. I live for drama. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not gratuitous drama, so, <laughs> but the human drama. <laughs> so in the course of that sort of drama unfolding, when did it start to take something that you would recognize as, let's say, a psychological exploration? And as distinct from a spiritual exploration, if, mm. uh, although I want to ask that as well. But do you remember when you started to say, wait, I'm looking at, I'm not just doing, you know, a dance pop song, or I'm not mm-hmm. doing just. I'm actually looking at some part of myself. I'm actually getting into a really interesting, maybe difficult portion of my own psyche. Mm. When did that sort of awareness start to creep into your mind? Mm. I had written songs as a teenager. I'd say five percent of which were psychologically, spiritually, emotionally oriented. Yeah. And to be honest. Anytime I wrote anything that didn't rhyme, it was frowned upon. And when I'm writing about matters of the heart, I can't always rhyme. (laughs) It's just not going to happen. Heart and apart, you can only use those words so many times. So so basically, when I moved to Los Angeles right around 19 years old, I remember saying to myself that I wouldn't stop the search for the ultimate musical collaborator until I felt the songs truly represented where I was at. And I didn't want to stop until that point. So... I think that commitment and that conviction that, that that was the only kind of expression I, I now wanted to do helped me not only meet Glenn Ballard, whom I wrote Jagged Little Pill with, but also right. open the door to writing really authentically. And I think Jagged Little Pill, I mean, other than being a just phenomenal, staggering success, mm-hmm. it's, it's not like one or two all-time best-selling albums by female artists in the history of the known universe. <laughs> um, I remember the impact that it had on so many people, again, in terms of just the emotional honesty of it, the emotional straightforwardness and mm. sort of truthfulness in it, which was very, very different than the types of songs that were being done at the time. Mm. And But I was curious, which again is, is part of what I was saying earlier about part of what I think your genius has been, has been being able to look into yourself mm. and come up with things that can connect with other people. 
Mm. And you also said something last time when we talked that I thought was very striking, which was something like your major purpose in life was to connect the human and the divine. Mm. And so I want to sort of ask about that as well. But just a second ago you said that you sort of vowed not to give up looking for the perfect collaborator. Mm. What part have collaborators played in your art? I think it's a combination of their being able to hold what I bring forth. So it would, would mean that their ceiling would have to be as high as mine, if not higher, in whatever area we were exploring creatively. Right. And, and then also um, for them to bring their own uniqueness to the table, the combination of which you know, their expression and my expression creates this third entity. And um, really that just describes the ultimate collaboration for me. Well, obviously you did pretty well with Glenn. Mm -hmm. Do you continue to look for collaborators? Yes, I just uh, finished an unbelievably incredible experience with a gentleman named Guy Sigsworth who's based in the UK. Um, right. We just wrote together 23 songs, 13 of which are on my new record. and the new album, yeah. finished last week, so... Yeah, I know. It's just, it's just wow. I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> I mean, congratulations. Thanks. That's it's so, so great. Thank you. <laughs> so where did you meet him? I had received a lot of names from different people who really were invested in my reaching out to different producers, right. um, none, none of whom I resonated with. So, yeah. i.e., I didn't even want to explore it because it just didn't feel right. And um, I'd heard a Fru Fru song called Let Go that Guy wrote with Image and Heap and produced himself. And I remember hearing that track thinking, this song is a flawlessly produced piece of work. <laughs> wow. So I phoned him myself directly, and we had a great conversation, and the jury was still out. Neither of us knew whether there'd be any chemistry creatively. And, right. And then we talked again on the phone a couple times, and then I flew to London, and we started writing, and within the first hour, wow. I knew that it was great. Apparently when the right collaborator comes along, it fits together pretty quickly. It does. It's uh, Glenn, in Glenn's case, Glenn's in my case, I'd been set up on so many what we consider to be blind dates with yeah. songwriters and some yep. of them are just disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are like, let's just go get some tequila and not worry about this. <laughs> but, um, but in Glenn's case, uh, when I went to his house, within 15 minutes we had written a song that we both still adore to this day. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And we're recording it just about as quickly. Yeah, fast. Same, Which same is pretty thing. astonishing. Yeah, if it's an overly thought out or belabored process, I, I really, at this point, I, I feel, you know, I have the luxury of, of knowing how it is to write something really quickly. So right. I don't, I'm not really that interested if it's a drawn out, arduous process. Right. So the two of you wrote 23 songs, and mm -hmm. 13 of those are on the new album. Yes. Is there a title for the album? Yes, it's called Flavors of Entanglement. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> that is Thanks. great. That's so sweet. Um, it's sort of all sorts of uh, ideas come to mind with that. It's a very free association term. Yes. And, and so I'll bet the songs are sort of like that, too, very rich and yummy. They run the gamut. Yeah. I'm also curious about when a sort of a more overtly spiritual side of you or component of you started to come more to the foreground. Mm. Well, I've always had a little love affair with God going. <laughs> yeah. For a fact, I can remember. So yeah. that would be hard to not have bleed into everything that I do. But it depends. Like, I've had a tendency to be a workaholic in the past, so I find that any time I'm actively involved in any sort of addiction... <laughs> Yeah. First thing to jump out the door is, is my connection with God. God yeah. never jumps out, of course, as you know. <laughs> but uh, I may I may try to roll up the window and lock it out. But that so, tends to be one of the things that you tend to forget is that connection when you're involved in yes. addictive behavior. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's the first thing to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Funny how that works. So I can tell when I have, you know, I don't know what term to use, but all my chakra wheels are spinning, all my kids are bonded inside me, I feel integrated, and I can tell, you know, when I'm connected to spirit, it means I tend toward less addictive behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. And addictions come in, of course, all types of flavors, addiction to 
I mean, the obvious ones, um, drugs, alcohol, and, and sex then jumped on the scene uh, uh, a few years ago as being everybody's favorite addiction, being a sex <laughs> addict, which I just... It's been a long uh, one for a, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's more freely spoken about now. And exactly. then, you know, addiction to, <laughs> and addiction then to work. Of course. Uh, yes, and work. Attention or addiction to busyness or... Power, yeah, um, yeah. Power control. Power. <laughs> <laughs> we know nothing of which we speak, but I, I've heard other yeah. people have this issue. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, that's what I, I hear, that people have these problems. Yeah, um, I read about it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on the fasting upside, on one of the websites, it, it said that you were basically a control freak, so that would be your, you consider that was sort of your addiction. Yep. Is that Was that quoted more or less correctly? Is that Sure. But I've yeah. put so much shadow work now that you could pretty much throw at any label, and I'd say sure. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, what what kind of shadow work are you doing? Um, I've been a, I guess, a student of Debbie Ford's for many years now. Um, yeah. And I haven't I haven't spent that much time in in their community in a while, but um, just really profound the the updated versions of Jungian work, and so many people have have really kind of adapted their take on wholeness and shadow work and there's so many great teachers out there of it and I you know it's it's what it's all about if my aspiration is to love as well as I possibly can and include myself in that love and I find that shadow work is directly related to that because if I see something outside of me that I don't like and it's stopping me from being able to love not only them, but myself. So yeah. as best as I can, whomever I meet, if I see something that makes me want to strangle them, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I can just say, well, that's me. Where is that me? Yeah. You know? Then that's, I mean, that's the, the simplified kind of version. Well, and that's sort of the gestalt notion of projections. It's just really so important that mm -hmm. we tend to hate those things and basically only those things that we mm -hmm. hate in ourselves and project first onto others. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, of course, working with an individual who had updated the Gestalt method and was working with that. Mm -hmm, yes. Have you actually done Gestalt work, or is it just part of this overall interest and in work that you've done sort of generally? I think I did a an updated version of it. You know, I don't I don't know if I've... We'd have to talk about it more for me to get a yeah. sense of whether I'm, yeah. I'm on the same page there, but I, I've definitely explored it and loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really very, very powerful, and I actually created something called a 3 two, one process, mm. which is, it wasn't done specifically to summarize what Gestalt does. It was developed for theoretical reasons, and then it was turned into a practical exercise, mm. but it turns out to be a lot of what Gestalt does when working with projections. Mm. Um, the 3 two, one is, basically, it reverses the direction that we start repression and projections from. So the original direction that dissociation goes is from a first person to a second person to a third person. Mm. So first person is I, so I am angry or I have anger. Mm. And then I push that away, and when I mm. push that away, eventually into a third person. Mm. And then it's not, I'm not angry, that person is angry. Mm. Or uh, I don't have sexual impulses, that person has sexual impulses. Mm. And so the first person stuff that is actually ours looks like in the shadow form it belongs to a third person it belongs to somebody out there it's not me mm -mm -mm. and so the three two one process reverses that wow. it says take whatever either dream image if you're working with dreams mm -hmm. or maybe at the end of the day whatever person sort of most upset you or most attracted you it can be positive things as well mm -hmm. and then actually identify the person so make that third person a second person. You put it then in a chair in front of you in your imagination, or you can actually do it. It's the empty chair in Gestalt therapy. Mm. And you then start a dialogue with that person, mm. and then you switch positions, and you become that person mm. so that you're re-owning that which you disowned. Mm. And it's a very sort of powerful technique to get us back in touch with our projections. Mm. and with those aspects of ourselves that we have disowned. Mm. And that's exciting, God. It is. It's fun. And so, and especially the light shadows, too. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, that's extremely important because people project the good stuff as often or more often than the bad stuff. 
Yeah, being in the public eye, I'm, I'm on the receiving end of a lot of light projection, a lot. <laughs> exactly, and I know what that's like, too. Um, yeah, you would. Yeah, I'm, I often say I'm, I'm not half the saint my fans think and not half the sinner my critics think. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> that works for you too, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Although, <laughs> my my biggest stretch would be to say I am everything they think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's very big mind. Yeah, <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> We're getting there, though. We're getting closer every day. <laughs> the stuff that you've done, the Gestalt and Betty Ford, the stuff at Esalen, has that also been something that you picked up rather early? That's probably not something that you were doing at six, but something that you sort of got an interest in psychological work, that kind of work in your adolescence, late adolescence? Mm. Yeah, I was, um, I was just trying to, <laughs> I was trying to heal my family with my psychic powers at, you know, four years old. <laughs> it was more clairsentient stuff when I was little. But um, I think in terms of psychology, which also just, for me, it's hard for me to separate the two. Yeah. For a long time, I really actively tried to separate psychology and spirituality, and I just could never do it. Because yeah, it doesn't work. The, the more I would do my inner work, the more closely connected to all that is I was, and so yeah. I stopped trying to separate them. Yeah. That's why I love the term transpersonal psychology, too, and right. and the terms that you use just re- resonate so much with me because of that. So, But the first book, I mean, I was re- reading The Cinderella Complex and all of these books when I was about... 11 years old. Wow. And then I read um, Harville Hendrix's Keeping the Love You Find right. when I was about 14 or 15. Wow. And that book really rocked my socks because it's pretty integrated in that it talks a lot about shadow work and yet takes into account the biological, you know, gender differences. Right. So directly speaks to childhood wounds and and the developmental stages of growing into a young adult, and so it was really touching on all these different aspects of the human condition while also tipping the hat to spirit throughout it. So so that book really kind of rocked my world, and, and yeah. I didn't feel crazy when I read that book. Yeah. First yeah. Time maybe. So, yeah. And the psychology and spirit being sort of inseparable dimensions of the human being is something I, of course, fully agree with. And still, I'm still sort of thinking about whether we see more of that integration going on nowadays or less of that integration nowadays, which is a point we talked about earlier. And I'm still finding, I'm going back and forth on it. On the one hand, I think it is getting quite a bit better. And there, Where do you see it getting better? Like what? Well, there's things like, not directly, but there are things like wellness psychology right. that has somehow succeeded in getting into conventional psychological domains. Martin Seligman, for example, who uh, I believe is the president of the American Psychological Association, has done a lot to promote positive psychology and psychology of well-being within the APA. And this is the APA that will not or just begrudgingly acknowledges humanistic and transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things are getting a little bit better. I find that there's an increasing acceptance of my work in terms of a lot of different types of areas and different disciplines that were not as accepting of them 10 years ago. So I think all of that is very good. And the downside is that it's still surprising, it's just shocking how some people apparently don't get the twitch you and I get when they go into a room and somebody is doing just the psychology stuff separated from spirituality or just the spirituality stuff separated from psychology. Mm. Apparently, they're immune to that twitch that Mm -hmm. we get, that integral twitch. And I find that I just still have a hard time wrapping my mind around people that are comfortable being that fragmented Mm. in their theoretical stuff and in apparently their personal lives. It's probably helping them survive in their own mind on some level because otherwise there might be more of a surrender to it or at least an openness to it. Yeah, I think that's right. In a sense, it's almost a transpersonal or integral psychologist would say that it's it's even a defense mechanism that they're using mm-hmm. against seeing the larger truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, larger truth can be really scary when when we've <laughs> when we've been taught to hold on to the very things that we think can be you know, exempt from the temporal aspect of life. Good point. And it's also one of the really difficult things that spirituality has is that 
the liberal press, and I don't mean to single out liberals here because the conservatives are even worse, but the liberal press really doesn't have any terminology or any understanding of spirituality except basically sort of two broad categories. One is fundamentalist nutcases, mm-hmm. and the other is New Age nutcases. Right. Either way, nutcases. That's right. It, it's that case. So, and so when a, when an actual, some sort of genuine spirituality comes along, mm. I mean, the liberal press doesn't know what to do with Zen Buddhism, for example, mm. and Jerry Falwell, right, right, or Osama bin Laden. I mean, to them, they're all doing that religion thing, mm. and it's just so extraordinary. At the very least, they don't recognize the difference between pre-rational religion and trans-rational religion, Mm -hmm. and they lump them all together. Mm -hmm. And that's an extraordinary handicap for getting spirituality out into a broader domain. Yeah, well, Um, discernment takes a a really huge, soulful muscle. It does, (laughs) doesn't it? It can be be exhausting for people. It's so much easier to one-dimensionalize and keep the fragmentation going. It keeps everything, the status quo, kind of normal, and change can be terrifying for people. Well, that's a good. That's also a good point, and I think that it's exactly that. It does take a large discernment muscle, mm-hmm. and absent that, keeping the status quo mm-hmm. is exactly what tends to happen. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it's so hard to get. I mean, the actual terms that the contemplative or or the meditative traditions like Zen or even Christian contemplative spirituality or Sufis, as opposed to Muslim exoteric religion, or Vedanta, any of those that are really core paths of the great liberation, Mm -hmm. paths of waking up, those are so different from fundamentalist, mythic, dogmatic religion, Mm -hmm. that they shouldn't even really be in the same category. Yeah, and the the birds trip us up. It's it's, it's crazy. I know. It's crazy. (laughs) And so it's just, Uh I mean... (laughs) It's the updated versions too. I mean, when our consciousness grows or you know extends, then our natural tendency is to update that which was come to however many hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. So I think there's a fear to update because it would require dismantling everything else that they're holding on to in their day-to-day life too. Well, I think that's exactly right. I think that's why the fundamentalists themselves are afraid to update it because they think that they have a mandate, usually from the founder of the religion, Mm. whether it's um, Jesus Christ or mm. whether it's Pope Muhammad. Or, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah. And that they have to believe exactly the word of that person or they're you know not going to be saved. They're not going to reach yeah. liberation or salvation. Or and, damnation in hell. <laughs> so that, well, exactly. That, that's going to be their reward. <laughs> Uh, I can appreciate some fear around that. <laughs> no, I can. We they all have our demons. Um, but that one is so huge and yeah. it's keeping like three-fourths of the world's population trapped. I know. In those levels. But I don't even mind in a sense if, if the press, and by press I just mean conventional society, but if the press had just a different understanding about what those fundamentalist religions are doing and what the contemplative or transrational or the paths of great liberation, the paths of consciousness and awareness and waking up, that they had some understanding of what they were doing. Mm. But again, absent that, it's just back to what we're talking about, which is fear of change, lack of discernment muscle, and makes it really, really difficult in even things like conventional psychologies. So that's what's made it so hard for transpersonal psychology to get recognition Mm. from the APA, the Standard American Psychological Association, because it has stuff to do with, you know, that God thing. Yeah, that God word. (laughs) I remember editing, you know, loosely, and I I loosely use the term editing, but helping someone with, you know, reading their book and just before they were handing it in, and their whole book was a certain vernacular and so clear, and I could tell that the word God was just going to freak people out in this book. And I myself recommended that they change the word God to life. You know, and sure enough, when when the manuscript was handed in, he, you know, he was very happy about it because he he knew that you know that God word freaked people out. <laughs> that's yeah. Well, you're, that's exactly right. Your intuition was right on the money, certainly for the way it's perceived out there. Mm. And that's a very actually, I think, it's a very wise piece of of advice. And it begs the question, which God, what God? Yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas other words are a little bit more 
Well, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Is what I'm saying. There's a, there's at least those two major, and there's not only just two. There's a lot, but but there's at least those two major, major different meanings of God. Mm. So changing that to life is, a, is actually a good recommendation. Mm. We face this all the time. I mean, all the books that I edit and the stuff that I do with Shambhala and Integral Press, and mm. it's a absolutely constant issue. And I've got to the point where there's just so many different terms that are used. <laughs> Three terms. <laughs> 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 Which ones do you use the most often? Which ones? do you feel best about using given your awareness of whom it is you may be communicating with? And, and that's my assumption. I I don't know if you are aware of who you're communicating with, whether you're writing it for yourself or, you know, are you writing with it with an awareness of who will be reading and, and saying things? According sometimes. To- and sometimes the terms are even things like transrational and super conscious and pure awareness, direct experience, awakening, any of those terms have almost no relation to something you're going to find in a fundamentalist orientation. Right. In a fundamentalist religion, it's essentially a mythic narrative that you are supposed to believe. And if you believe it and profess belief in that narrative, then you are saved. You you reach eternal salvation. Right. And if you don't believe that narrative, then eternal damnation, basically. Right. Whereas the paths of the great liberation are about waking up, and they're mm-hmm. not about believing anything. Mm-hmm. They're about experiencing your true nature, mm-hmm. experiencing your real self. Yeah. And that's that's very different. So those kinds of terms, even real self, higher self, and true nature, and so on, <laughs> are things that we find that we use. Although sometimes, though, we're trying to actually sort of poke a stick in, well, the eye of people that are using the word God. So I did a thing called the one, two, three of God, which sounds true, which was talking about, again, first person, second person, and third person, the three different ways that you can look at spirit, basically. Mm. And we chose to go ahead and use the instead of saying the one, two, three of spirit, Mm -hmm. to say the one, two, three of God, Mm. just because we wanted to get two people that are really oriented around that fundamental concept. Great. That's a great example of using the exact word that you know will achieve the goal. Exactly. (laughs) You are listening to www.integralnaked.org. So when it comes to spiritual practices, what just sort of generically are the kinds of things that you do, or do you not have a specific practice? Well, I mean, I know that you've done a lot of work with Iyengar Yoga, for example, but just what are some of the kinds of things that you find yourself doing? Um, I'm a dabbler. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That <laughs> You're a professional <laughs> dabbler. I'm an unpaid dabbler. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm an apprentice dabbler. So um, I, much like my exercise regimen, changes all the time because right. I get really. Anytime I get too locked into something, it really touches on my work that I've done to move away from perfectionism and yeah. and beating myself up. So yeah. I believe there's a version of discipline that can be gentle. Yeah. So basically I do everything from being, you know, I don't even use the word meditation because it freaks me out. So I, yeah. I yeah. use the term being still. <laughs> That's good. Or watching That's my thoughts. That's nice. Um, yeah. Uh, watching my thoughts, being in nature, praying, singing, certainly music is such a form of meditative practice for me Definitely. and soulful connection. Definitely. Certainly when I'm on stage, there's an exaltative, experience for me that I feel lost in in a, in a way where my feet are still miraculously both on the ground. Dancing, sweat your prayers. I do a lot of five rhythms dancing. Very cool. Um, which I All of those sound very genuine. Yeah, they're great. And nature is probably my favorite. Standing anywhere near an, an ocean or on a hike. You know, And I have I have two dogs, so spending time with my dogs is right. a huge, huge spiritual practice for me. Yeah. 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 And it does reflect what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the one, two, three of God is briefly, one of the things that I tried to point out in that presentation is something that 
once you hear it, it sort of makes sense, and you go, oh, well, of course that's the way it is. But mm-hmm. nobody had really pointed this out before, and that is that you can look at spirit or ultimate or God through three different perspectives. Tell me about that. The first person perspective is the person who is speaking. Second person perspective is the person being spoken to. Mm-hmm. So first person perspective is pronouns like I. Mm-hmm. Second person perspective is pronouns like you. Mm-hmm. And then there's a third person, and the pronouns for that, the definition of third person is the person or thing being spoken about. Mm-hmm. So it's him or her or them or they or it. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that a very, very smart, awakened Savvy people have defined spirit according to all three of those perspectives, Mm. but there's no real understanding that all three of them should be allowed because they're all equally adequate. Mm. So the third person perspective pictures the spirit as a vast, great sort of it and describes it as the cosmos or the web of life or nature. Mm. Mm. or anything that you sort of you see as an object mm-hmm. and sort of takes over the entire manifest objective world and it's usually described them in third person terms like the web of life the great web of life is a mm-hmm. fine example of of third person and then second person is you imagine the entity that created that cosmos created the universe created the grand canyon created nature mm-hmm. and imagine that person sitting sort of in front of you Mm. But it's an intelligence, but it's a second person, so it's a thou. Mm. So that's an I-thou relationship, then. You're actually having a second person relationship with spirit. Mm. And that's often what God has thought about as second person. It's somebody that people actually have conversations with or pray to or feel a personal yeah. presence of. <laughs> yeah. And, yes. And then first person is one of the more interesting ones. And that's that spirit is ultimately I amness. Mm. It's the pure awareness or big mind or mm. true self mm. that's looking through your eyes right now and looking through my eyes right now mm. and is this pure I amness or pure self mm. is ultimate spirit. Mm. And uh, mystics are the ones that are really good in getting onto spirit in first person because they maintain there's a supreme identity between the individual and soul and mm. the pure spirit or larger so there's both a one two and three all three of those perspectives are fine Mm -hmm. and all three of them should be allowed is sort of the point Mm -hmm. because all three of them make sense right and instead of having one is right and the other two are wrong which is usually what we see going on right the idea is that all three of them work just fine mm, and they do you, they? <laughs> yeah, they do and yes I, the reason i thought about it is when i was listening to the sort of your smorgasbord board of practices they touched on all three of those mm, and they they do it depends on you know what moment of the day it is it, is that a, <laughs> is, is that a, um, a technical uh, no practice <laughs> it's a happenstance, <laughs> it's a happenstance. <laughs> yeah, which is in and of itself a practice of course okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I, I love that. I love what you just shared. That's so uh, resonant. and that's... It makes a kind of sense, doesn't it? Mm, it really does. Make and sense. being able to see spirit as nature and then being able to see spirit as a thou and being able to see spirit as I am, as this mm-hmm. pure I. Yeah. And all of those are, you know, what we're called, I think, to sort of to realize in our lives. Mm. And as you say, to connect the human and the divine is ways to connect our small self with all three of those bigger things, connect yeah. our small self with nature, or connect our small self with thou, mm. a great thou, or connect our small self with our higher self. Mm. I am. Yeah, the small self to you, small self means what? The wounded aspects of self, or what? What does small it, self mean to you? Small self is the self contraction, or the separate self sense, or mm-hmm. the self that feels that it's Alan Watts called the skin encapsulated ego. Um, oh, that's basically, <laughs> which is sort of self-explanatory, mm-hmm. but it's just that it's a, that we have. You know, most of the great mystical traditions are founded on really just a handful of similar ideas, even though yeah, they're expressed different, very different, different words. Different. Yeah, I love yeah. that though. I can't get enough of different versions of that similar could, yeah. energy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the general idea is that there's an absolute or ultimate spirit. But there is an ultimate, but the question then comes up, why doesn't everybody know there's an ultimate? And therefore, all the traditions have some version of Maya, 
which means illusion or separation between mm. the individual self and God bless the, the duality. <laughs> yeah, the duality. It's a, yeah. the, and it's a fallenness or a duality or a separation, sin, contraction. Mm. And that kind of duality, that kind of illusory separation, mm. creates a separate self that mm. feels set apart from both its higher self and set apart from God and set Very apart lonely. from the world out there. That's, yeah. that's hell and damnation on earth. Maybe. That's exactly right. That Lord knows I've experienced it in many moments. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I can laugh about it now. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. There have been moments where I really did believe in the illusion of that. And I think ultimately, when we were talking earlier about you know life purpose, and, and in this case, my life purpose, just talking about the whole concept of connection. And, yeah. And I can distill it into three parts, really. It's my life is here. I was born to take part in the healing of rupture between self and self, self and other, and self and spirit, or God. And There you go. And um, really, you know, having distilled it in that way has worked for me, because literally when it comes down to the practical matter of, you know, a request coming in for a show to do or somewhere to show up or a charity to take part in, I literally just go back to that as my template. You know, is, is this speaking to what my life purpose is? Is there some, you know, love being applied to some rupture here? You know, right. and, and the answer can come really quickly when I have that to reference in making decisions. Reference means that, meaning self and self, self and God, self and other? Yeah. Yeah. Did I get that right? Some, some, yeah, because that's first, second, third person. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I have okay. it on my little board in my... Well, I have two offices. I have an inner work office at my house, yeah. and then I have a sort of career office, for lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I found keeping them separate has actually really helped me. I thought, you know, Mrs. Integration, you know. But I, <laughs> I like the thought of keeping them separate. It makes it really clear. So you the sort of part of your own self-developed practice is a kind of inquiry into whether your actions help to overcome these disconnects. Mm. Yes, it, I'm, I've always been connection, like to the point where I spent a lot of work doing shadow work, and this was the, one of the hugest turning points for me, and I created some jewelry with some poetry based on this revelatory moment for me, yeah. is it don't lose it. My brain loses things when I'm about to say something. Okay. <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, okay, so I was spending all this time integrating all the shadow work, and shadow work, I think, is inherently based on the realm of duality. Yeah. So, you know, I can claim that I'm a murderer and that I am, you know, I am a messiah, I am here to save the planet, I'm here right. to rape the planet, all of these shadows that I can claim. Right. And the one I was having trouble with the most was I had a hard time embracing the the shadow that I thought existed, which was that I was innately bad. Oh, wow. And so I spent a lot of time trying to claim that one, and much to the chagrin of people around me, <laughs> like, I just feel like, <laughs> I need to integrate this one. They're like, stop it already. We love you. Jesus, <laughs> that's our faces. <laughs> so I did a lot of work around it. And then one day this, this teacher that I was speaking with, she said to me, she said, well, that's the only one that is actually false. <laughs> it's the only one you'll never be able to integrate. You'll never be able to claim that one, which really spoke to what came into my awareness as the greater truth, which is that underneath all of this dance, that there is a fundamental goodness that right. is the life stream, is the source, all the beautiful words that, that you use and that you know people have come up with over the years. Right. Um, so I wrote a poem, a little couple lines that says... Um, Beneath the storms and suns of mind lies a good that knows no opposite. And I put that on some jewelry uh, that I wear. And it was, it was great because I finally found, I cracked the code, the one shadow that can't be claimed. Yeah, and I think that's right on the money, absolutely right on the money. And the, what, without an opposite is a perfect way to describe it. Mm. And it's the actual the Upanishads describe Brahman, the ultimate mm. reality, as one without a second. Yay, yeah. And and, then, and and it also says, interestingly, then, where there is other, there is fear. And what, mm. but all they mean is not intrinsically, mm. because there can be other without fear, but when either there's other that's disconnected mm. from this ultimate reality, then that mm. creates fear. So mm. you get basically this pure connectedness, this basic goodness, mm. and then it falls, if you will, illusorily falls mm. 
into the small separate self and others. Mm. And so reconnecting mm. is something that gives you back a recognition of that basic goodness that was actually ever present, mm. but got obscured mm-hmm. in all of the dramas that we but can create to do. Slammed into this realm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or flew into it, depending on. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a you know I, I I know I am not alone in my you know undying desire to just reconnect. And for a long time, as a younger person, I, the the question that was begged was reconnect with what? Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to go back into my mom's womb. Can I crawl back in? But um, <laughs> but also just just seeing that the awareness of of that underlying goodness that actually has no opposite has just helped the whole dance. Of this you know. That all makes perfect sense. I mean, and it's really, it's grounded in the, in the great perennial traditions. I mean, they would mm. agree with that mm. right down the line. So I think that's really beautiful. And you know it works because when you connect like that, there's a sort of a deep uncoiling of the self-contraction and the whole mechanism of creating disconnection and fear and mm. anxiety of, the, of that fundamental nature. Mm. And it, I... I this empathy springs forth from me toward anyone who is, you know, I understand addictions even more now. I just think, of course, you know, yeah. everyone, all of us on some level is yearning for that, you know, the true nature of self, that, that yeah. blissful yesness, you know. It's yeah. Like, yeah. So I understand. I mean, we're, we'll search for it however we can get it. For a long time, I was searching for it through other. You know, I spent many years thinking I would find it through other. Yeah. In my case, personally through romantic relationships and it was only over the last couple of years that I realized that was a dead end. <laughs> <laughs> not going to find it there. <laughs> Although I can express it and share it there, it's not going to actually be found there, you know, so. Yeah, I, that is sort of an occupational hazard of women mm-hmm. tend to be relational, but then they get, if there's dysfunction, they, if they get lost in relationship, they depend too much on it, they look to relationship for salvation and and that desire to heal the rupture is when it's brought into the practical kind of illusory duality, you know, yeah. romantic relationship aspects. It's like, uh-oh, don't take it into you have to heal the rupture in this particular relationship in this particular form. Yeah. Because you don't have to, actually. Yeah. And that was really liberating. You know, it's like, shit, I don't have to? Yeah. If I can still love this person and I don't have to hang out with them? <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, without tipping the cards too far, how is your relational life? And what was just generically the shift that sort of allowed you to see that your salvation wasn't going to be in, in another? Um, I think hitting my head up against the wall one too many times to the point where I started thinking it was pathetic. <laughs> yeah. Like, I didn't want to hear uh-uh. one. I didn't want to hear another Alanis Morissette breakup uh-uh. song. I was like, we got it. <laughs> uh-uh. We got it. You're either going to be cut off and you have to have a, a very long-term moratorium on any kind of romantic interaction, or there's going to have to be a different song that comes next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so really it just came from me getting sick of my own self in a, in a albeit somewhat gentle way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So have you tested the waters with that new yeah. approach now? <laughs> It's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I have been. It's um, what can I say about it at this point? You know, of the qualities that that really speak to me most during this chapter, anyway, right now, it's always been love, but yeah. love more as a verb, yeah, instead of a, a feeling. You know, I think that's the ultimate speaks to the ultimate maturation process is taking love from it, simply being viewed as a feeling into an actual action or a verb, and then and then this sense of freedom. You know, it's oh, yeah. being freedom, you know, and, yeah. and not in the, oh, permission for the wounded self to act out freedom, although that's lovely, too, in moments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the freedom to really listen to my personal rhythms and, my, and honor what I'm pulled toward and, and look at what I've had shame around. And, I mean, all these people have been mirroring back romantic friendships or otherwise. I've been mirroring back these parts of myself, and I do believe there's great healing to be had in a committed interaction Right. You know, Harville Hendricks speaks about you know, the degree of healing brings from the degree of commitment and intimacy. So I, I, yeah. I'm a huge fan of it. Yeah, yeah. But I think I went too far to the other extreme where I just kept thinking that salvation was found in making the ultimate perfect relationship. Right. <laughs> and right. unfortunately, I had to turn into a controlling freak 
in order to <laughs> even attempt right. to come close to it. <laughs> so, uh, so I f- figured a few things out, and I say figured out. It sounds like a mental process. It was the opposite of that. Yeah. But I love how Buddhism speaks about what is it? The two kinds of meditation: the analytical kind and then the settled kind. Right. <laughs> So I think using my brain and my surrendered self in combination has been really helpful in this. So It's a common saying. I mean, even Carol Gilligan, his recent writings have, have focused on this, that in women in particular, because there is an orientation towards relationship and care and connection, whereas men tend to be agency and rights and justice tend to be separate. Mm-hmm. And when men get in trouble, they become hyper-autonomous dickheads. Mm. Whereas women become sort of herd mentality, sort of trying to save the relationship at all costs. Yes. And men... Two different orientations, one toward and the other away from. (laughs) Basically, it is. Men protect themselves at the expense of relationship, and women protect relationships at the expense of themselves. Ah, bless you. Yeah. (laughs) Bless you for distilling. (laughs) (laughs) But part of the real difficulty... For women, according to Gilligan, it's just that, that women want to keep the relationship going. And so they choose to submerge the voice of their own deeper selves Mm. or not listen to it. And so they get caught in a very, very difficult round Mm. of, I want the relationship to work, and basically surrendering themselves, and not in a good sense of surrender, but in a sense more of just like, horrible sacrificing and just completely sort of yeah. mushing down mm-hmm. their authentic voice yes, of, yes, yes. of their self. Um, so <laughs> I that, don't know what you're talking about, although yeah, I haven't exactly. read about I, it. This is completely <laughs> alien. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some women struggle with that, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And men, of course, get to face the, sort of the, the polar opposite of that, the photographic negative, and they have to learn to, in order to save relationships, to listen to relationship and not always listen just to themselves. Mm. And so it's equally kind of difficult in an opposite way, but for men to get into relationship and trust the relationship that they're in and trust that is going to give them important dimensions and aspects of their lives mm. that just their self mm. is not going to give them. They're right agentic, autonomous, hyper-autonomous self is not going to give them. And so yeah. it's a dual dance, this boy-girl thing. It's really... <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. And then we have to have our integrated aspects of it into the homosexual community, too, because constantly I'm, I'm talking about, you know, not what we're talking about right now, but versions of, you know, the dance of romance. And, you know, then there's a whole other qualities that come into play in homosexual relationships, too, and... I keep wanting all these amazing books that I've read to be translated for the homosexual community as well. I can't do it myself, Yeah, <laughs> but uh, maybe someone can. <laughs> yeah, because it is, it, it is a, with some obvious differences and some relocations, um, mm-hmm. a large part of the essential core mm-hmm. carries over. Yeah, the contrasexual self. Issues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And these sort of fundamental yin-yang patterns show up, whether the body is male or female, homosexual, heterosexual. Yep, and the uh, tendency toward, yeah. uh, the orientation toward running toward or running away from is, you know, a lot of times, if not always, they will be linked up. They will, you will find your perfect complementary, you know, match yeah. at some point. So. Yeah. So relationship has sort of fundamentally shifted then for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's yeah. much more freedom and... You know, the whole, the, the irony of my having read The Cinderella Complex when I was 11 and really I'm getting, <laughs> getting it, <laughs> sort of getting it now. But, uh, yeah, just knowing that, God, it's a hard one to, to drop that whole thought that some knight in shining armor is going to come and rescue yeah. me from it. And in my personal case, having a super masculine life, like really actively being out there. Right. You know, my, my knight in shining armor fantasy was triple fold because... There wasn't just, you know, a damsel in distress rescue required. In this case, it was, you're going to have to rescue me from my damsel stuff and from all this, you know, (laughs) adrenaline-using, active, masculine, you know, being out there in the world aspects of my life, too. So so it took a while to just create that inner parent in my own self enough to go, okay, they're not going to do it. No one's going to do it. And not in a, you know, not in a fatalistic way, but in a great way. Like, no one is coming to do this. So what do we do now? 
And so you are or are not, remind me exactly which way you were going with this, working on memoirs to sort of put some of this wisdom into book form? The word memoir makes me cringe. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> That's... It's so egoic, and I, uh, I, no. you know, I have to embrace it, you know, but... But I, no. but I'm not yet. <laughs> Someone can write a memoir, some version of a memoir about me when I'm gone, but um, or not. But I, I'd like to at least put something together, and I, it'll be in the form of a book. And I, I have this um, really excited about putting together more of a dialogical speaking tour, and I do believe that the the book will be born of that. So, oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah. And say a little bit about the dialogical speaking tour. So my own version of that song, which is, you know, basically being at the front of the room and opening up the floor to conversations pertaining to art, to relationship, to God, to, you know, and there there will be many, you know, many questions posed that I don't have the experience to be able to comment on, and I will say as much, but um, but really just getting the room moving, (laughs) right? you know, and so I'd like to start doing those in November. And participate in that as where the substance of the material for the book would come from. Yes, and and I already have. I had a book deal put into place, and and it was a, a lovely situation, but I, <laughs> I was like, is it possible to have a book deal with no deadline? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, ah, no. <laughs> okay, I got to go. <laughs> Forget it. Forget I asked. Um, <clears throat> so I basically turned away some, some pretty juicy book deals because, uh, you know, in this case, I just really do believe in divine timing of it. And right. I have enough material for, you know, three books right now, but I, I don't know, a little, little bit of a blockage in it. You know, I might be overly pathologizing it. It's maybe not a blockage, it's just not the right time yet, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does it feel like a blockage to you? It feels more like right timing, side, sort of. Right timing a little bit, and you, of all people, would be the greatest person to see to about this because you are so <laughs> prolific. And you, to me, don't seem blocked, although I'm, I'm assuming you may have had some moments of it. But No. I, no? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong assumption. But uh, I also have that Canadian egoic problem of how dare I write a book? <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but then there's an element of how dare I not write a book, too. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, that's, about that. <laughs> well that, I think it's that's good more sort of shadow stuff in terms of what's, you know, holding you down. And, mm-hmm. I mean, you know on the face of it rationally that, uh, of course, you have a right to write a book. I mean, mm-hmm. your accomplishments alone, they just sort of end that argument. So mm-hmm. I... I pretty much don't think it's there's really any rational truth to the how dare you write a book. So that well, anytime there's a contraction in me I can assume there's some false things I think around that there. part is <laughs> just a, a little Canadian shadow <laughs> running around back. Yeah, I don't know so. if you know many Canadians but <laughs> we have some we have our biggest shadow is arrogance. Yeah. Um, so not all of us of course but <laughs> Yeah. So uh, uh um, so the material lying around, though, is stuff that you kind of written, sort of your notebooks kind of thing? It's sheer brilliance, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it. it's, uh, it's everything from photographs, sort of travelogue, um, poetry, lyrics, articles that I've written for magazines, essays, thoughts, uh, Q&A, right. lots of Q&A throughout. I love that format. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I, I don't know. I think it sounds. I think it sounds interesting, and I think that we we're talking about the specific one, sort of horribly labeled memoir, but just sort of a book that reflects on some of this. I think it would be great, and I think it would be a sort of a terrific chance for you to go through it and frame it that you really are going to do it as a book, mm-hmm. and you really do deserve to do it as a book, and and then see how that comes out. Mm, thanks. Yeah, I, um, I've had the. The luxury of having a collaborator and in having had it so many collaborators, there's been a a built-in structure and discipline that just, you know, is born of our coming together in order to make a record. And frankly, there's so much money being put into making a record that it ups the ante in terms of really practicalizing the whole process where, and I don't know if you experience this, but I, I feel in writing a book, I feel like I'm floating. And maybe it would be great to have a deadline, actually. <laughs> Let's get that deadline back. Oh. <laughs> Let's get that money and a bunch of people breathing down the back of my neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
Um, <laughs> but I think also I've had, I'm moving out of workaholism, so I yeah. think there's a lot more room now to actually think, okay, once this record cycle is over, it might be perfect timing to write a book. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah, it sounds like it might be. And also kind of, it sounds like your life is coming together in a in a lot of really positive ways, mm-hmm. both exteriorly and interiorly. Mm. And so that would give you a chance to reflect on it from a place where you're feeling good mm. uh, about it. Yeah, I was speaking yesterday with a friend about how how dangerous and violent I feel it is when the assumption is that artists can only write when they're broken. You know, and while I do know such beautiful art is spawned from it, I think it's dangerous to just send the message out to the planet that as an artist you can only create when you're in dire straits. Yeah, it's one of my pet peeves. I agree entirely. I, I think it's a horrible message to associate great art with. Mm, dangerous for artists. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, I, I don't think that's right. So I think that now it's sort of pausing at a good place in your life could be a, a cool way to do it. Mm, yeah, thanks for that. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, I'm going to go right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great. You've been incredibly generous, incredibly generous with your time. And, and like last time, I mean, every time we talk, I just sort of want to keep going. Yeah, um, So this has been wonderful, just really, really wonderful. Mm, thank and you so much. Let, let's stay in touch. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Needless to say, if you're ever going coast to coast or want to drop by the Denver area, you're always welcome. Uh, Mm -hmm. Love to see you. And vice versa, too, if you're ever in Los Angeles. Yeah, got it. California, it would be great to break bread and continue to be continue this. It would. Yeah. It would. This is great. Well, you're wonderful. You're just wonderful. You are wonderful, too. So inspiring and lovely. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bye now. Bye. You are listening to listening www. Naked. 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 Na